ერთი, 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 ერთი. Ერთი, ერთი, ორი, სამი, ერთი, ორი, სამი, ერთი, ორი, სამი. Ერთი, ერთი, ორი, სამი, ერთი, ორი, სამი. ერთი, ორი, სამი, ერთი. ხო სუფთავდა, უკვე გასუფთავდა. ერთი, ორი, სამი. ერთი. კარგად ისმის უკვე. Մոցմեպա, շեն մոցմեպա, շեն մոցմեպա, երդի շեն մոցմեպա, որի շեն մոցմեպա, սամի շեն մոցմեպա.
ارتی یوری
ارتي 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 ارتي
Evet. Ha, so art. I am a stove. Tell Darby, she ha. I said, was a kitten. I always a close. A kitten. Art always. A kitten. Tavera, it's was to the ones. Ha, so. I.
ერთი ორი სამი
ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to the, tonight for this, I think, wonderful event. Uh, the purpose of this event, of course, the book, which is <laughs> Back to Containment, dealing with the Putin's regime. And uh, we are fortunate to have uh, David Kramer, author of this book, and the distinguished fellow from the Atlantic Council, uh, Ambassador Daniel Fried, today, uh, together with us, uh, to talk about the U.S.-Russia policy uh, relations. And uh, um, I am very proud, and I, am, I don't know how I deserve this uh, honor, that David and McCain Institute gave us this uh, copyright to translate it to Georgian language. And now today we have this bilingual book uh, of David's book. <laughs> and uh, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Daniel Fried to moderate this conversation uh, tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, David Kramer was my colleague in the Bush administration in the second term. He was responsible, he was the deputy assistant secretary responsible for Russia policy. And he later went on to be assistant secretary for human rights. And I have to say that he was, in, he was earlier than many in realizing that Putin was not simply moving in an authoritarian direction at home but that this had implications for Russia's neighbors, which were not good. So he was right earlier than most in Washington. Um, and his book discusses both the evolution of American policy toward Russia in the Bush and Obama administrations and contains recommendations for the future. Um, and I'd just like David to speak about the main points of his book. Um, then I'll say something and then open up, open up the discussion. Great, Dan, thanks very much. Um, let me start first by thanking Nino Evgenidze. Um, without her, the, I wouldn't be here in Georgia so many times in the past few years, and uh, certainly the production of my book in Georgian would not exist, so I'm deeply grateful to you, Nino. I did catch a few typos in the Georgian uh, which I fixed. <laughs> I am joking. I wish I would be able to, but fortunately there are no typos, I'm told. So uh, many thanks to you. Also, many thanks to Writers House of Georgia. It's an honor for me to be here uh, in such a distinguished uh, building. And my thanks to all of you for coming. And let me also extend a, a deep thanks to uh, a man who was my mentor at State. Uh, from whom I learned many, many things, and uh, also a very good friend of mine, uh, and Dan Freed, who I would say has been one of the finest diplomats uh, in the U.S. Foreign Service, who retired after 40 years uh, earlier this year. And if you have not read Dan's farewell speech, I could not recommend it more. Um, I, I decided to write this book, and I thank the McCain Institute in Washington for giving me the opportunity to do so. Um, after having spent eight years in the State Department and the Bush administration, and then eight years as an observer on the outside, but still in Washington, of the Obama administration and its reset policy. And then with a new administration coming in, I didn't know which uh, person was going to be president next, but decided it might be useful to offer a, a, a roadmap, a, a strategy and recommendations for the next administration to pursue. And so, I uh, start the book by looking at how Mr. Putin came to power. And I think it's critically important because it, it shapes your view from the beginning of, of Vladimir Putin. And if you look at what happened in 1999, soon after he was appointed prime minister, the four bombings and then of course the bomb that didn't go off in Razan, those four bombings that killed 300 people turned the political situation upside down in Russia. And it kept, arguably, either Yevgeny Primakov or Yuri Lushkov, who were not really in the Yeltsin circle, from coming to power. And instead, Mr. Putin did, and then became president a few months later. After using brutal force in Chechnya, leading to 
thousands and thousands of casualties, and yet Putin showed that he was a decisive, strong, sober leader in contrast to the doddering uh, Boris Yeltsin. But I think what we see early on with Putin's rise to power is a diversion of his interest versus Russia's interest. And we see this uh, by his efforts to stay in power no matter the cost. And that, I would argue, is not in Russia's interest. And everything else derives from that interest, uh, that objective of staying in power no matter the cost. Um, uh, Vyacheslav Volodin, who was the deputy chief of staff, famously said in October 2014, there is no Russia today if there is no Putin. Any attack on Putin is an attack on Russia. And to accept this logic uh, would justify whatever measures are necessary to preserve Putin's control over power in, in Russia. It gives Putin a green light to engage in any kind of repression at home and aggression abroad. But if you look at the steps he's taken, and this is where the diversion begins, taking over nationwide TV was one of the first things he did, taking channels from Berezovsky and Gusinsky, because Russians got most of their news and information from television. And in taking over these channels, he was able to control the messaging that Russians got and was able to shape how Russians viewed the political situation in their country. He appointed Kadyrov as leader of, of Chechnya uh, and provided a faux sense of stability at an enormous cost in human rights and human lives. Increasing the state's role in the economy, something certainly in Putin's interest, but something really not in Russia's national interest. He's kept the economy very dependent on export of natural resources. He responded to the Magnitsky Act in one of the cruelest ways possible by banning the adoption of Russian orphans, the most innocent citizens in, in that country, by American citizens. Massive corruption in Russia that Putin oversees, that is not in the country's interest either. And his search, constant search for an enemy uh, of, of the United States, of NATO, the European Union, the West in general, Ukraine, Georgia, enemies everywhere threatening his grip on power, threatening Russia, trying to spawn a, a revolution in the country. Um, the, the U.S. has been an enemy of Russia's uh, in Putin's mind for decades. And yet, George Bush Sr., Bill Clinton, George Bush Jr., for whom I worked, uh, Barack Obama, have all sought good relations with Russia. And yet, at the end of their terms, all of them saw the relationship with Russia in a more challenging way. Putin has needed to perpetuate the myth that the West, NATO, the EU, and especially the United States are threats. And this started with his poor handling of the Kursk submarine. It continued with the Dubrovka theater crisis. And then, of course, Beslan, where he famously talked about other powers trying to take a juicy piece of, of Russia. If we move ahead to where we are today, and uh, we can come back to policies in the Bush administration, the Obama administration, <clears throat> which I focus on in the book, um, but if we, if we look at where we are today, then I think we have to accept and recognize that Putin's Russia, and I do try to be careful in using either Putin's Russia or Putin's regime or the Kremlin differentiating Russia and Russians writ large from the problem I think we face in, in Moscow. But if we look at Putin's Russia, I would argue it is a serious threat, even an existential threat, to us in the West, to its neighbors, and to its own people. Putin's authoritarian, kleptocratic regime obviously shares no values with us and increasingly shares fewer and fewer interests. He's invaded this country, he's invaded Ukraine, refuses to recognize the concepts of sovereignty and territorial integrity and the right of countries to determine their own future. He uses energy, cutting off energy supplies, often in the height of winter, 
and propaganda to pressure and undermine his neighbors and even countries further overseas. He launched a cyber attack against Estonia in 2007 and sought to mess with Ukraine's 2014 election. He is a, a Russian leader who, a, a, a true Russian leader, a, a leader looking out for the interests of the country should want prosperous, thriving, democratic countries along Russia's borders, not Mr. Putin. He sees those kinds of countries, this country, a, a prosperous and successful Ukraine, as threats to the system he has set up in his own country. Putin has failed to abide by numerous international agreements, and I'll quickly run through the list. The Sarkozy 6.6 ceasefire plan for this country, the two Minsk agreements on Minsk, Budapest Memorandum of 1994, the Friendship Treaty with Ukraine in 1997, to say nothing of the principles of sovereignty and territorial integrity, as I mentioned, he illegally annexed Crimea, sparking the most serious security crisis in Europe in seven decades. He bears, I would argue, ultimate responsibility for the murders of 298 people shot down in the Malaysian airliner. He broke from the CFE treaty, and Dan and I spent far too many hours trying to save that treaty, and he's been in violation of the INF treaty. Most recently, there have been disputes over the Open Sky Treaty, and he acts as if no ceasefire agreements in Syria apply to Russia. Syria, let's not forget what Putin has done in Syria. He intervened militarily in order to prop up a like-minded dictator in that country and has, uh, has bears responsibility for the deaths of thousands of civilians. He, Russian targets have been against humanitarian convoys, hospitals, civilian centers. Rarely have Russians, Russian forces targeted ISIS in Syria. Our interests don't align in other places either. Take North Korea, where there has been hope expressed by certain Western leaders that Russia could help us on North Korea. Instead, what Russian officials at the UN have done is to undermine and water down resolutions passed by the UN Security Council. Russia has increased trade with North Korea, while China possibly has stepped back from some of its trade. Russia has established a ferry link with the Russian Far East and, and North Korea. In Afghanistan, Putin's forces have been supporting and possibly even arming the Taliban. Our interests there don't con coincide. How about Iran? Yes, Russia supported a UN resolution on Iran that, that toughened sanctions there and was a party to the nuclear accord, but Russia also works closely with Tehran in supporting Assad. Russia has also sold uh, modern advanced weapons systems to the Iranian regime and supports their efforts to stir up trouble in the Middle East. Putin and Russian officials have threatened the use of nuclear weapons against states that might host missile defense sites, and even against the United States with Dmitry Kislyov's favorite a uh, famous phrase of saying that he would reduce, or Russia could reduce the United States to radioactive ash. Putin's forces have engaged in muscle flexing, including reckless maneuvers, buzzing NATO ships and aircraft, and violations of other countries' territorial integrity. And then, of course, there's the unprecedented interference in various elections, including the election in my country last year where I would argue the effort was not simply to influence the outcome of the election, but to discredit the very idea of free and fair elections and discredit the notion of democratic systems of government. And given that Russians still deny any and all responsibility for all of these actions, we should have very low expectations about what we can achieve through engagement with this regime. Finally, after returning formally to the presidency, Mr. Putin, in 2012, has launched the worst crackdown against human rights inside Russia. He's created an environment in which government critics, journalists, activists are thrown in jail, harassed, beaten, and even killed. He's hunted down those who have opposed him, whether they're inside the country or outside the country, 
people like Alexander Litvinenko. He's created a massive kleptocracy whose best export to the West is corruption. Putin, in other words, is a wholly untrustworthy interlocutor who poses a, a serious threat to us. He doesn't think in win-win terms. He thinks in zero-sum terms. So this leads me to offer a few recommendations, both things not to do and then what we should do. So let me start with what we shouldn't do. We should not make Mr. Putin's life any easier by easing up the pressure on sanctions. Nor should we abandon those Russians who are struggling for a better future for their country. And there are many Russians who want a better future for their country. Similarly, we should not stay silent about Russia's deteriorating human rights situation. We certainly should not consign Russia's neighbors to a Russian sphere of influence through any grand deals, accommodation, trade-offs, or general neglect. We should stop obsessing over whether we are entering a new Cold War. I now am at Florida International University, having left Washington. In an academic setting, this issue is interesting. But in the real world, I would argue it's irrelevant. The new Trump administration, now not so new, almost a year in, should avoid appearing to want good relations with, with Moscow more than the Putin regime wants good relations with us. We should never telegraph to Putin what we won't do in our policy, just as Obama did when he said the U.S. would not provide lethal military assistance to Ukraine. We should not personalize relations with the Russian leader. And we should set aside concern that taking a tougher approach toward the Putin regime will drive it into the hands of the Chinese. Of all the things that kept me up at night when I was in the government, Russian-Chinese rapprochement was not one of them. So that, that's what we shouldn't do. What should we do instead? In broad strokes, I think we need a policy that tightens the screws on the Putin regime. We need strong American leadership partnering with our European allies, steady engagement at the highest levels of our government. This is not an argument to never talk with Russian officials, but we should keep our expectations from any outcome of those talks very low. We need to be modest in what we can accomplish with the Putin regime given the lack of uh, values and increasingly fewer interest. We, sh we need to contain Russia to prevent and preempt further aggressive behavior pushing back on Putin's aggression. This includes beefing up, not simply maintaining current sanctions and tremendous tribute to Dan for the work he did uh, during the Obama administration with the sanctions imposed after the invasion of Ukraine. We need to bolster Russia's neighbors, starting with this country, including Ukraine, and moving on to others, and beef up the defense of NATO allies as well, as we have been doing, and I credit NATO and the U.S. for what they've been doing in this respect. We need to support democratic, reform-minded forces inside Russia, not give up on them. We need to prevent the import of corruption from Russia into our countries, we need to do a much better job of cleaning up our own house, expose corruption and illicit activity where it exists. We need to neutralize Russian propaganda, not with counter-propaganda, but by supporting fact-based journalism for people inside Russia and people who live near Russia. Every single American administration since the Cold War has, sought, has thought it could do better than the previous one in dealing with Moscow. Every single administration has come away severely disappointed. We must stand for our values and our principles together with our allies. We have to avoid personalizing the relationship and we should reject any moral equivalence between Putin's Russia and the United States and the West more broadly. As I argued in my book at the very end, the Trump administration needs to avoid repeating the errors of past administrations 
or making new ones of its own. At the end of the day, as I've argued in several appearances, including a debate at the McCain Institute in October, how many more Russian liberal activists need to be killed or poisoned? How many more countries does Putin need to invade? How many more Ukrainians need to die? How many more civilians need to be killed in Syria? And how many more elections does Putin need to interfere in before we understand the existential threat that the Putin regime represents. Thank you. Uh, I have little to say principally because I agree with your conclusions, which is not surprising since I went through the same administration you did. I would say this. The Bush, well, the Clinton, then Bush, then Obama administrations all tried and all failed to develop better relations with Russia, just as you said. I will say this in defense of those three administrations. It was a failure, but an honorable failure, by which I mean that when pressed by circumstance, the American presidents did not do a dirty deal with Russia. They did not sell out other countries, but resisted Russian aggression when put to it. Clinton enlarged NATO to the Visegrad countries. Bush enlarged NATO to the Baltics and understood that his hopes for Russia had failed. Obama starts out with the reset, which I thought was mm, exaggerated, but he ends up leading NATO to put troops into the Baltic states and sponsoring sanctions against Russia over Ukraine. So I would call these honorable failures, but I agree with you that we have to do better than honorable failures. All right. Second point I would like to make, and it was implicit in what you said, but I want to make it explicit. We need to differentiate between Putin and Russia. That is, I believe that Russia is capable of being better than it is today. I do not think Russia is civilizationally doomed to relive its worst, the worst of its history. Now, that may seem like naive American optimism, but I also believe that in Russian history, Russia, Russian periods of external aggression are matched by periods of internal repression. And when the external aggression fails, then, but maybe only then, Russia turns inward to periods of reform. But there's no need to tell Georgians anything about this. Everybody in this audience knows it better than any Americans coming to Georgia. Um, so you don't need to hear from me. I, I think we would all benefit hearing from you. Um, David and I also came for an excellent two-day session um, with the Georgian presidency and government um, uh, dealing with many of these same strategic questions. So it's a pleasure to work with a friendly government about the options we all face dealing with difficult circumstances. And with that, I think we should open it up to um, our friends here um, for questions, comments, um, observations. Who would like to start? And please, for, for us, please identify yourselves. Thank you. I'm Kudawa, Free University. Could you, David, please elaborate on uh, what you were saying about uh, uh, Trump administration's, administration's real policy to, uh, towards Russia or Europe, according to you, because uh, it would not be in your book. Thank you. I think you have to distinguish between the rhetoric and the actual policy and actions. I've been pleasantly surprised at the 
policy to the extent that there is a coherent policy. The beefing up of NATO allies, the beefing up of the presence here, the provision of javelins here is, is great. Um, I hope we see the same thing in Ukraine. Um, that was, I think, a, a, a major mistake by President Obama in the previous administration. Um, Vice President Pence's visit to Estonia, to this country, to Montenegro, was terrific. He went further than I ever would have guessed he would in reaffirming U.S. support for this country's membership in NATO. Uh, and so I, that leads me to conclude that you have a friend in the Vice President of the United States. Um, I give Vice President Biden great credit in the previous administration for being a strong friend and supporter of Georgia, of Ukraine. Um, I criticize President Obama for never having once visited any country along Russia's borders that was not a member of NATO. He never visited Ukraine um, as President of the United States. He did visit when he was Senator, with Senator Lugar. Um, he should have come here. Um, showing up by an American President matters. And so I, I, I hope that we will see more engagement at the highest levels of the U.S. government. Secretary Mattis has been great. If you look at the con uh, confirmation hearings of Tillerson, Mattis, Pompeo, Haley, um, a few others, everything they said, I think Dan and I would be in large agreement with. They were very tough on Russia. So if you look at what's happening below the presidential level, I think there's a lot to be pleased with. And then we get to the president, and this is where there's a disconnect, um, where he does seem reluctant to voice criticism of, of Mr. Putin. Um, and he keeps talking about, wouldn't it be great if Russia and the United States got along? The, the simple answer to that question is, of course it would. It would be wonderful if Russia and the United States got along. I simply don't think it's possible as long as the Putin regime is in place in Moscow. The only way it could be possible is if we sell out our values and principles and our interests and our allies. And so I, I hope we don't go down that path and waste much time. Um, but so, so there's, I'm not even sure it's a parallel path. It's almost different paths where the policies have been pretty good and the rhetoric from the highest level has not been. Um, now, first of all, it's uh, every day that I'm an ambassador in Georgia is a great day, but it's particularly, it's really a great day when you guys are here. These, these two gave me my first job in the Bureau of European Affairs, and it was a great, great couple years. I don't know what it says about your judgment that you hired me, but uh, it was a real honor. Sorry? Okay. <laughs> um, and thank you for answering that question, Mamuka. I, I, I agree with what David said about that. I'm not going to answer the question, but... And I also agree, David, with your, uh, uh, with your recommendations, but I would like to ask you to, um, to provide a little more um, detail on a, on a couple of issues. I mean, I, I agree that we have to tighten sanctions, but how do you tighten sanctions without feeding into this narrative that the West is encircling us, trying to squeeze us? Um, and then uh, how do you support the, the reformers, the, the, the people who are really putting their, their, um, their livelihoods and maybe even their lives on the line to advocate for values that, uh, that we hold dear, um, particularly from your perspective from your previous job at, at Freedom House? Uh, how, how, does, how does the U.S. do that? And, and finally, just, you know, I really agree that we need to uh, draw a bright line between um, what is Putin's regime or Putin's Russia and what is Russia and I agree with Dan that Russia has tremendous potential that is not being um, realized and the Russian people are not being served by um, by Mr. Putin and his whole regime. Um, first let me just say um, I think all of us are fortunate to have you here as uh, Ambassador Ian so uh, kudos to you for the job you've done through a very distinguished career. <laughs> Following in the fine tradition of Dan Freed, you are also one of the Foreign Service's finest, so thank you very much. Um, on, on sanctions, Dan and I may have a disagreement here. I, I, I give enormous credit for what 
has been accomplished between the U.S. and the Europeans, Canadians, and others. I, I argued a few years ago that the Obama administration mixed up means and ends. Unity between the U.S. and EU is great. I don't know anyone who's opposed to it. But it's a means to accomplish the goal of getting Russia out of Ukraine. It's not an end in itself. And so it is easier for the United States, one government, it's still hard in the U.S. government, as we all know, it's a big government, but it's easier for one than to get agreement among 28 to move ahead with additional sanctions. I, I think it's actually quite remarkable where we are right now on sanctions, that, that we are largely in sync. But I would argue if it's easier for the United States to move ahead with additional sanctions, the United States should do so. The current sanctions don't line up exactly anyway. I, for example, like the fact that Kislyov is on the EU sanctions list. He's a disgusting, hate-mongering propagandist. He's not on the U.S. sanctions list, and he should be, along with Solovyev and others who, who spout these horrible, they're not journalists. Um, and so I, I wish the United States would catch up with the EU there and then go further. I, I've argued that we should drop the Minsk peace process. It's not working. And what we should do is simply replace it with a declaration, this may be fanciful on my part, um, but replace it with a declaration that unless and until Russia withdraws its forces from Ukraine, sanctions will be increased over X period of time. And again, if it's easier for the United States to do that than for the EU, so be it. So I, I, I don't want us to underestimate the effect of the extraterritorial nature of U.S. sanctions. Our sanctions are powerful. EU sanctions are also powerful, not to underestimate those. But uh, sometimes it's just easier if we go alone. Um, on the reformers, do you want to jump in on the sanctions before I go to the reformers? You go on. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll babble and then he'll correct me. Um, uh, on, on reformers and how can we support. For starters, it was a huge mistake for the U.S. State Department to have announced in 2012 that Russia was kicking USAID out of Russia. We announced that Russia was taking this action instead of forcing the Putin regime to say they were kicking us out. We made it easy for them. Um, second, um, we, we sh I think the targeted sanctions are ways of supporting democratic liberal forces in Russia. I remember Boris Nemtsov argued that the Magnitsky legislation passed in 2012, which goes after Russian officials involved in gross human rights abuses, was the most pro-Russian thing the Congress had done in decades. And praise from Nemtsov to me is worth, it, it's priceless. Um, and others have voiced similar views that those kinds of targeted sanctions that aren't against the country writ large, but go after the individuals responsible for the problems, that's the way to support them. It, it, it doesn't level the playing field, but it brings the, the abusers down a notch. Um, and then the third point I would say is regime, and I argue this in the book, regime change would be nice in Russia. We know the current regime. I don't like it. I'd like to see a different one, but that should not be U.S. policy. It's well beyond our means. It would backfire. It would paint a bigger bullseye on any Russian who has any ties to the West. Changing the regime in Russia is for Russians to decide. And I, I hope it's done peacefully and democratically and soon. Um, but I don't expect that will be the case. Nevertheless, that should not be U.S. policy. Um, and I know some supporters of Ukraine have argued that we should do more to stir things up inside Russia to promote kinds of secessionist movements, I think that's dangerous. Um, but standing by our values and principles and cleaning up our own house so that we don't become enablers of this regime, being bought off, as has been happening increasingly, that too will uh, send a clear message. As usual, I agree with most of what you said. Um, with respect to sanctions, a couple of points. First of all, looking back, we should have imposed sanctions on Russia after the 08 war. Yes. Yes. 
We did not do so because the Bush government was out of time, out of steam, and Europe was divided. That's a reason, but it's not a good enough reason. So we should have, we should have done that. Secondly, I differ with you about Minsk. I think that Kurt Volker, known to many Georgians, uh, is now the chief US negotiator on Ukraine. He is working with the French and Germans on Minsk. Let him come to the conclusion that we need to ramp up sanctions and let him try to do it with the French and Germans so we act together. That said, the Russian interference in the American elections complicates our, uh, our sanctions. That is, the Obama administration going out the door imposed additional sanctions on Russia because of its election interference. These were weak sanctions. I had a hand in developing them. They weren't strong enough. But at least the Obama administration laid down a marker. The question now is whether the United States and Europe will develop additional sanctions in retaliation for Russia's interference, not just in our elections, but in various European elections. And secondly, whether or not the United States will issue a strong list of those senior Russians and oligarchs who are close to Putin, a list which has been required by the new Russia sanctions law. That was probably the single most important provision of that new sanctions law. And I knew that because uh, the Russians sent their lobbyists and agents all over Washington to ask people, including me, to work with the administration to keep various Russian clients off the list. That means that Russia is concerned about that American Kremlin report. So watch this space. We will see what the Trump administration does with it. I don't know where sanctions will end up. I think there are various scenarios in which they could be increased. The Russians have themselves to blame. One final point about sanctions. I understand, David, your point about acting unilaterally, and I don't rule it out, and we did in, with respect to the attack on our own election system. But I will say this in favor of US-European solidarity. I don't know this for a fact, but I would be willing to bet rather a large amount of money that Putin told his inner circle, the Europeans will never join the Americans in sanctions. Their consensus will fall apart. Putin was wrong, and more importantly, he was proven to be wrong. That is worth something. Because if our objective is to show that the West is not as weak as Putin supposed, then we, are on, then we have demonstrated that fact. You can never tell about timing. In the 1980s, we thought, there were many Americans who thought the Soviet Union was still winning the Cold War. By 1989, things looked different. We should not underestimate the possibility of success. Georgia's resistance, Ukraine's resistance, the West's support for Georgia and Ukraine may yet bring about strategic success. I don't know that for a fact, but that is possible. And we should have faith in ourselves and in our values. But of course, that's not taking issue with you. That's basically the theory of your book, which I applaud. Can I add one quick thing? Just because we're fortunate to be sitting here in Tbilisi. Um, you mentioned about the lack of any sanctions after Russia's invasion of this country. And I, I talk about this in the book. Um, I do think that was a mistake. And you, you are right to point out the Bush administration was in its final months. Uh, the fighting itself ended rather quickly. Um, but that was not an excuse not to take the right step. And in fact, 
it not only opened the door for Obama's reset policy, which came less than a year after the invasion of this country, I think it gave Putin the sense that he could go elsewhere, including into Ukraine, without having to pay any price. Um, so I, I do think that was a, a mistake uh, in the Bush administration, um, but then made worse by Obama's uh, eagerness to uh, develop the reset policy. Uh, but Atlantic Council of Georgia. Uh, David, first of all, I would like uh, to extend the sincere thanks uh, uh, from the Georgians and all the nations living in the oppressed world for holding the line for the free world in every position you've been, and it's well appreciated. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, also comment uh, your book, uh, besides its uh, value for the policy makers, besides its value for historians, I think it has an one very important value also for the new generation of the Georgians who never been born in Soviet Union, fortunately to them, but uh, they have been uh, also together with us victims of the Russian aggressive, uh, aggressive revisionism in our region. So that would be a very useful book for them to have a perfect understanding how precious is freedom and how we can fight it back. And the key is to keep uh, values intact and uh, to maintain the moral high ground. And with this, I would like to really acknowledge the uh, uh, brilliant representative of uh, young Georgians who volunteered to translate your book. This gentleman. Raza Shengelia, and they, exactly that was his motivation to translate, to share the content with the many young Georgians who are present here, and uh, I'm sure they will read it. So now my question as well, uh, David. Uh, then you mentioned that uh, we had, uh, we am saying we because it was our uh, defeat, honorable but defeat, but uh, it was enough honorable defeats now. We need success. We have to win. Uh, and the first uh, recipe to win with, uh, with our Russia and the Putin's Russia uh, is the title of this book, to contain the threat. But the next step, and a successful historical example of President Reagan and the U.S. policy showed us, is also to be offensive, to push back. Sanctions is a very strong component of pushing back uh, towards Russia, and it works, definitely it works. Uh, giving javelin missiles to Georgia is part component of this pushback. So what else you could recommend to push back Russia? Thank you. Um, Batu, thank you for all your support over the years and your friendship. Um, you, you know, you talked about the importance of values, and I very much take a normative approach in this book. And a central theme is the way Putin treats his own people violates their human rights, is indicative of how he's going to behave with other countries. Um, if he doesn't respect the human rights of Russians, unless and until it's politically expedient to do so, um, then he doesn't, he's not going to recognize and accept the concepts of sovereignty, territorial integrity, or give a damn about the human rights of Georgians, Ukrainians, or anyone else. Um, it, and, and so I think it is very important that we pay attention to how regimes treat their own people, not just in Russia, but around the world, and not give leaders a free pass, or not go after journalists with comments of fake news and other kinds of epithets that are thrown around, because it only gives the Putins and the other kinds of leaders uh, the reinforcement that they shouldn't get. Um, on other kinds of um, pushback containment, uh, it, it comes in many ways. I, I, I would argue that on sanctions, it's not sufficient to simply maintain existing sanctions, good as they may be. It's important psychologically to ramp up sanctions because the target of sanctions, as Dan knows better than I, needs to think that if he doesn't change his behavior, then he's going to get hit with uh, more price to pay. Um, otherwise, there's sort of a settling in and an acceptance and an adjustment to the new environment if the sanctions simply stay, stay where they are. Um, we should not take options off the table. I'm not arguing right now 
that we should expel Russia from SWIFT. It's much harder to do, easy to say, but we shouldn't tell Russia we're not going to do it. It should be an option kept on the table. One thing that the U.S. has started to do um, is to export energy uh, to, to this whole region. That is a good way to undercut Putin's leverage and, and also go after some of the money that uh, supports the regime. Um, on, on things like disinformation, I, I support the F uh, Foreign Agent Registration Act uh, for RT and Sputnik. I, I actually think what is better, I argue in the book, is that we not legitimize these kinds of outlets by allowing them to act as journalists they're not. The, the Congress, I think actually the media organizations that cover the Congress, recently denied accreditation to RT. The State Department, the White House, the Pentagon should not accredit anyone who works for RT or Sputnik to cover those uh, departments, those agencies. They ask questions that are meant not to get at news and information, but to simply disrupt things. They're not journalists. We shouldn't treat them like journalists. And I, I also think that since their funding comes from the Russian state and the Russian government, when Russia loses court rulings uh, that require payment of significant sums of money, we could start by seizing the assets of these entities. Um, and that would be a twofer in my opinion. It would uh, reinforce rule of law by carrying out the orders of, of courts that should be respected. And it's also a way of dealing with these, uh, uh, these um, RT and Sputnik. Um, so I, I, I think that the beefing up of the military presence um, in the Baltic states and Poland, the increased interaction here, um, all these things are critically important. And, and providing javelins not just to Georgia but to Ukraine I think is also very important. I share the view that Kurt Volker has, has uh, enunciated, which is it would not lead to escalation on Putin's part, but it would show that there would be a higher price to pay for further involvement. That said, the one criticism I would have of a report that was done last year, two years ago, uh, by some uh, think tanks in, in Washington, one in Chicago, it was too dismissive of the possibility of escalation we would have to be prepared for what we would do in the event of Russian escalation if there were some. Um, and I think that needs to be thought through more carefully. Sorry for the long answer. Again, I agree with what David said. I would add one oh, more. <clears throat> I, I really like that phrase. Uh, there is one more point to make. Ultimately, the strongest defense against Russian aggression is a strengthening of the democratic institutions <clears throat> within the countries endangered by Russia. This is not theory, this is practice. This is what we learned from 1991. Ukraine learned the hard way that it, that it had been hollowed out by corruption and so lost Crimea without a fight. When it rallied, it held on to even a large part of the Donbass. That's what Georgia can do. I mean, Georgia needs to, of course, strengthen its military and work more with the United States and NATO, and there is room to do so, I believe, including with the Trump administration. But Georgia's re democratic resilience is not just a phrase, that's real. Putin wants it's Russia's neighbors to be hollowed out, corrupt shells, sovereign only in name. We want to see strong, prospering, Europeanizing democracies on Russia's border. And that's, that is still within Georgia's power to do. To do. Regulated the GMT group. Um, thank you very much for your book. I read it and it offers very interesting insights. But I would <coughs> say, uh, offer to you the one train of thought and I would like to hear your comments about this. 
Sometimes it seems to me, and it's nothing new, it's widespread opinion that it's not about the Putin, that Putin, but if not Putin bringing someone, Sidorov or uh, something, it, nothing would change much. And it's, it's about the content of the country, let's say, who sometimes seems to be fatally predestined to be as aggressive as it is. If we take the, back the history, like the, from the mid-16th uh, century until now, the elites of Russia, being it boyars or it's French-speaking aristocracy or then commissars, or even the famous anti-Soviet uh, anti dissidents like Solzhenitsyn turned out to be a great nationalist. So maybe it's something inbuilt in the elites of, the, of this country or in the psyche of the country that it uh, sets on, uh, on the track that it is now. So then it implies a different way. Then it's not about the Putin, but it's something bigger probably. And that probably then implies an absolutely different set of policy. If we know that the animal or bear is a rabbit, then it's uncurable, no? So your comment about this, please. Thank you. Um, I, I certainly would agree that the problem is bigger than one individual, Mr. Putin. It, it's the regime, it's the system that came about with the breakup of the Soviet Union um, U.S. endorsement of Yeltsin's re-election in 96 didn't help. It didn't help that we were calling Russia in the 90s a democracy when it wasn't. We wound up, I think, unfortunately, discrediting the notion of democracy in Russia in the 90s, a period of, of great difficulty, including not just in Russia, but here and elsewhere. For many Russians, they said, if that's democracy, I don't want any more of it. I'd rather return to strongman rule, that individual will know what's best for the country. So there is a tradition in Russian history for that. That said, I, I, I don't accept that Russians, if given the choice, would continue to want to be ruled by one man who one day can wake up and decide he doesn't like that individual, that village, that city, and imposes Stalinist-like methods. I, I do believe, as President Bush enunciated in his second inaugural address that all people, if given the choice, would vastly prefer to live in a free society um, with free elections, independent institutions, checks and balances, um, a, a vibrant civil society, and independent media, um, the, the essentials of democracy. Um, the sovereign democracy is, is not real democracy. Um, and I think, as I said at the, uh, in my opening comments, Putin's takeover of nationwide TV was a brilliant but also um, evil move on his part because he was able to control the messaging that Russians uh, receive. But I, I'm also struck at how quickly moods can change. I am worried about the polluting of Russian minds with anti-American, anti-Western, anti-democratic rhetoric. I, I, I'm very worried about that. And I worry that some Russians will be inculcated with that kind of, of, of uh, teaching and then carry things out, whether it's like the Tsarnaev brothers in the Boston Marathon or elsewhere. But at the end of the day, I, I also remember how quickly the Russian narrative switched from Ukraine one day to Syria the next. And it suggests that there is the possibility that if somebody more responsible and more democratic came in and changed the messaging that Russians might be receptive to that too. Um, so I, 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 I don't quite, I don't accept actually that Russians by nature are incapable of living in uh, a free or more democratic society. I think they are like others who if given a choice, and this is where the Russian opposition does need to try to get its act together against enormously adverse uh, conditions. Um, when people like Nemtsov, a friend of mine and Dan's and many people in this room, a shot and killed yards from the Kremlin and other friend, uh, many of you know of Vladimir Karamurza, poisoned twice, uh, that underscores the dangerous environment in which people who are brave enough to take on the Putin regime, they face every single day. Uh, but there are more people like that in Russia than I think at least in the United States is commonly perceived. Vlad Sokor, you had your hand up. Vladimir Sokor, Jamestown Foundation. Congratulations on the publication of your book, David. I was going to ask you what would be your uh, policy recommendations for the United States and for America's allies 
regarding the situation in Donbass and in Transnistria. At one stage in your career, you were the US negotiator on Transnistria. And I remember the high level that your frustration had reached at that time, uh, not only because of the deadlock, but because of the way in which the deadlock came about. You answered preemptively the question about Donbass. I applaud your answer. I also regard Minsk as a trap on Ukraine that was sprung up by Russia and that our task is to extricate Ukraine from that trap, not to implement that trap on Ukraine. So I, I applaud your answer. What about Transnistria? Considering that Russia pursues in parallel two special status projects of all possible places, Russia pursues a special status project in Donbass and in Transnistria. What is your view, your recommendation? And my uh, second question, what would you recommend to the United States and its allies to do regarding Nord Stream 2? Um, let me take the second question first. I, I think the project should be killed. Um, simple as that. And, and I sense after the election in Germany, while there's still a negotiations about the formation of the new government, that the chancellery is backing off of its support of Nord Stream 2. It seemed that the chancellor's support for it may have been tied to the election, frankly. Um, that may be a little unfair, but um, it's a pipeline that is not commercially viable. It's a pipeline that would do terrible damage to Ukraine. It's a pipeline that would increase Germany's and other European countries' dependency on Russia. Um, and it's a pipeline that shouldn't be built. I mean, Nord Stream 1, the last I checked, was not up to full capacity. So if that pipeline is not up to full capacity, why on earth do you need another very expensive pipeline other than to feed corruption and increase dependency and hurt uh, Ukraine and other countries? Um, let me just, I'll come to Transnistria in a second, but on Minsk, um, there, is, there are many flaws on the Minsk, both Minsk agreements. They were both signed under tremendous duress by the Ukrainian side. Um, I agree 100% with Dan that we couldn't have a better person than Kurt Volker handling this issue right now. Um, but it, Minsk doesn't even address the issue of Crimea. Uh, it's not mentioned in either version of the Minsk agreement. And I would take the same approach toward Crimea as the United States and the West did toward the Baltic states. If it takes decades where we never recognize the annexation of Crimea, that should be our policy. And we should keep sanctions that apply on Crimea in place until Crimea is returned to Ukraine. On Transnistria, um, yeah, I did spend a few frustrating years as the U.S. representative in the 5 plus 2 process. Um, I, I worry about, and you know the, the situation, Vlad, there much better than I do, but I worry about the current president of Moldova um, and his uh, leanings toward Moscow, maybe leanings is a gentle way of describing it. Um, and uh, I, there, too, we were talking about when it came to CFE, how Russia needed to fulfill the Istanbul commitments of 1999 and never has. Withdrawal of forces and then the return of Moldovan control over Transnistria. When I was involved in the 5 plus 2 process, I was struck by the comment of the then Transnistrian negotiator, uh, this guy, who said if you want to solve the Transnistrian conflict, incorporate Moldova into the European Union because Transnistria won't want to be left out of that process at the end of the day. It would be difficult transition for it because of corruption that sustains the Transnistrian regime. I, I do think deeper integration of Moldova into the West for all of the challenges and problems in Moldova is probably the best way to solve that uh, crisis. And continued pressure on Russia for its illegal uh, occupation of, of Moldovan territory continued pressure on Russia for its continued illegal occupation of Georgian territory. Um, pressure is the way to do it, I would argue. Uh, one other thing, sorry, just uh, on Minsk, um, the, the UN peacekeeping idea, I think is also a trap uh, that we shouldn't fall for. The, Putin never had in mind the placement of UN forces along what is the recognized Ukrainian-Russian border, as you know. Um, and instead, he wants to make uh, official 
the, the demarcation line with, with Donbass. Um, we shouldn't fall for that. And, and frankly, I don't think we should spend much time trying to find a solution in that respect. I, I, I just think pressure, Surkov is not interested in solutions. He's interested in process, endless negotiations, being able to sit down with a U.S. interlocutor, whether it was Toria Newland or Kurt Volker. Um, and, uh, but I, I just think we've, we've spent a lot of time and energy negotiating with them on that issue, and it's not going anywhere, despite the best efforts of some of our finest diplomats on this. Amanda Majori, National Security Council, President's Office. Um, thank you for writing this book, and uh, I think it's timely, it's important, and thank you, Nina, for translating in Georgian, because I think something that we should uh, let our uh, students who we have um, t read this and think about it and talk about it. But uh, there are a couple of points, frankly speaking, I would like to make. I mean, your book is called Putin's regi Regime, and obviously this regime is based on the 86% of support, public support, and the policies, not just personality, the policies, whether it's Crimea, Georgia, etc., U.S., Europe. So uh, I think to a lot of Georgians, this idea of two Russia has been kind of completely gone. We don't believe in two Russia, most of us, because it just doesn't exist, because I, there's a difference between Russian politics and Russian mm -hmm. literature. And we, base, we experience that's on ourselves, but Georgia was very close to Russia, and that's what Russia did to Georgia. So, um, and also, I think it's based on, it's policy-wise, it's a very smart thing to do, distinguish Putin regime and people, etc. But uh, people who resist Putin's regime is a minority within minority. And the leaders who have represented this minority are Navalny and others who are also with the same kind of agenda. So I don't really see much of kind of policy except what Bato was saying for Georgia and countries like Georgia to resist, to deter, to contain, to deal with it, and we have to live with the Russia next door. It's going to be difficult times for Georgia, but I think the whole idea of you know, United States and Europe dealing it together with the sanctions, with the realistic policies, NATO is the only way, and including partners in these arrangements, not just to tell them, oh, partners are different. We are as important, I think, in this equation for Russia as Baltic states and any other because they understand the heat exactly where the weak spots are and then tell the rest of the world that's what the U.S. cannot do and that's what we can do, support our partners. <coughs> so my question to you is, I was, when I was studying in the United States, we had a very smart person who was always asked for the last 20 years, uh, what do you think about Saudi Arabia's regime, how stable it is? So he was talking about, oh, next 10 years. That's always his answer. And five years ago, he said it's stable for next five years. My question, not based on kind of uh, predictions, but your analysis. How long do you think Putin and the whole regime and Putin is will last, and how far it can exp expand within the region or within the European, whether you see the perspectives of Russian winning over Russian-speaking population in uh, European countries and the whole idea of Russia should be part of Europe and U.S. should be out. That's my question. Thank you. Um, the, the famous American philosopher uh, Yogi Berra uh, once said, predictions are really hard, particularly about the future. Um, I... The, the, I guess I would offer this. We think these regimes are stable until they're not. If we look at what's happened in this region in 2004, and then again 13, 14 in Ukraine, what happened here in 2003, um, you look at the Arab world in 2011, I don't think many people were predicting what happened in the Arab world. Um, and it's not to say that what emerged after the movements there is better. Tunisia is probably the only country in which you could say that. But I will say that as long as Ben Ali and Gaddafi and Mubarak and Saleh and Assad remain in power, there was no hope for Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Yemen, Syria to move in a more democratic direction. 
Their removal does not guarantee that those countries will have a better, more democratic future, but at least it provides an opening for that possibility for the first time. I would argue that we don't know what the tipping point might be if there is one in Russia. Um, Putin was spooked by the protests in December 2011 after the Duma elections, continued into March and May of 2012, and it's why he led the crackdown uh, after he came back to the presidency. He was spooked, actually, and I mentioned this in the book, um, after he went into the ring of a, uh, what is it, UFC fight um, with, between a Russian and an American in which the Russian beat the crap out of the American. And Putin decided this would be a great time for me to go into the ring and hold up the victorious Russian's hand. And you know what happened? He got booed. And so you, that kind of crowd is not the kind of crowd you would think that would turn on the Russian president. And yet, you, the point being, you never know what might trigger a change. I think the support for Putin, while high, is very shallow. In part because Russians don't see an alternative, in part because Putin doesn't permit an alternative, a serious alternative. Um, but if given an alternative, it may not be better. But we know what the Putin regime is like, and I don't like it, and I don't think most people in this room like it. We shouldn't operate, however, out of fear of the unknown that the successor to Putin could be worse. Might be, might be better. We don't know, and at the end of the day, as I argued earlier, it's not our call to make anyway. It's for Russians too. Um, so I, I, on, on statements by people like Navalny and others, it would be political suicide if they went too far out on certain issues. And it's not to say that they would flip and be more pro-Georgian than Georgians or more pro-Ukrainian than Ukrainians. Um, they have to operate in a difficult environment there. Um, but um, we, we know what we get with the current regime, and it's not pretty. Um, there, there may be something to be said with a roll of the dice with, the, with an alternative. Uh, well said. There is... Okay. There is so there. Someone mentioned Solzhenitsyn, but there's also Andrei Sakharov, and it's not our responsibility anyway. The only point I would make is that Georgia has some ability to affect things because Georgia's ability to succeed on its own terms as a free country will have an impact on Russia. That's not why you're doing it. You're doing it for yourselves, for your future, for your, the future of this country. But a free Georgia is standing evidence of the failure of Putinism. My formative experience was the Cold War, where we were losing, we thought, until we won. Don't, down, don't dismiss the possibility of success, but keep your powder dry in the meantime. And it doesn't, uh, when you were speaking, it struck me that it doesn't, we don't have to resolve this issue of whether Russia can be better than it is. We all agree that Russia is a danger. We all agree that we have to resist. And then we'll find out. It doesn't, we were, we are not, the, the, we may be, to your way of thinking, naive, Amer naive Americans with respect to Russia's future, but we are not arguing that we have to give Russia a chance by abandoning Georgia. Okay, there is that school of thought. I can't stand it. And David and I have fought against this so far successfully for a generation. So we don't have to resolve the issue of whether Russia is capable of being better than it is. Resist Russian aggression, and we'll find out. I'm prepared to be wrong, um, and I'm sure you hope we're right. But we don't have to figure, we don't have to decide. Other thoughts? Third. 
Congratulations with your new book. Thank you very much for letting us translate it into Georgian for those who don't read English. Uh, this is really important piece of work for us Georgians as a sign of encouragement and piece of very valuable experience and information, but also for your countrymen, for policymakers who are uh, struggling with the dilemma how to, how to handle the situation, which is way, way out of hand. Finally, it is acknowledged that Russia is a threat, uh, and um, there was mentioning, uh, Dan mentioned uh, Cold War here, and during the Cold War, uh, with its ups and downs, uh, at least you knew, I mean, I mean, the United States knew that uh, the ending of Cold War would mean the defeat of communism. So containment that was uh, coined by one of your presidents, Truman, if I'm not mistaken, was uh, for uh, that goal. What's the final goal? What's the goal of your cont containment here? What's the definition of winning over Putin's regime in your, uh, in your world, in your universe? Because it's uh, very important. Uh, during the Cold War, the end of Cold War released uh, captured nations like mine. And uh, what's going to happen when Putin is uh, defeated? And what's the definition of Putin's defeat, in your, your opinion? Thanks. Um, I'm not sure that there is a victory at the end of this process. Uh, because if you view it as a victory, then the other side views it as a defeat. And that gets us back into the zero-sum term way of thinking. It's not to argue for win-win, because I do think that's a naive a approach. Um, but my idea that we are winning, maybe not won, but winning, is Georgia, Ukraine, others are able to choose their own future. The day that this country and Ukraine join your Atlantic institutions, that actually may be victory um, because we will have overcome the Kremlin's efforts to establish a de facto veto of other countries aspirations. Um, it will mean restoration of a sense of sovereignty, territorial integrity, and the right of countries to choose their own future. Um, and so I think, I think um, getting Russia out of Ukraine, getting Russia out of Georgia, getting Russia out of Moldova, those would be the things that I would look at as moving in the right direction. And Seeing Russians have the ability to have free choice would also be maybe a long distance uh, objective and goal. But again, that's for Russians to determine and decide. Um, but, but I do want to come back just because it looks like we're going to wrap up. All of us need to do a better job of looking in the mirror and cleaning up our own acts. Corruption in Ukraine is what left Ukraine vulnerable to Russian influence um, and to explosions twice, in 2004 and again 2013-14. Um, this country is no, not immune to it. Our country is not immune to it. Um, and in fact, I think more, the more and more digging that's done by journalists and, and NGOs into the Russian uh, influence in the United States, it's scary. Uh, we sort of woke up one day and said, how did that happen? So we have to do a much better job of living up to the principles that we have stood for in the Cold War. That's what separated us. The values that we represented and stood for, that's what I think people who lived under Soviet oppression aspired to join. And we have to make sure that we don't abandon those values and principles that are at the root and foundation of our, our country. Well said, and I think that's an excellent note on which to end the session. David, congratulations on the book. Thank you, thank you so much. On behalf of the uh, audience, thank you so much. And thank you being the freedom fighters in the world, best freedom fighters in the world, and the uh, best friends of Georgia. And please do not allow us to fail. <laughs>